began to say Then like lightning from heaven That old stone was rolled away And like dead men, the gods They all stood there in fright As the power of love displayed Yeah. 
light the first two candles of the Advent wreath, a candle of hope and a candle of peace. Now we light the third candle of Advent. This is the candle of joy. As the coming of Jesus, our Savior, draws near, our joy builds with our anticipation of his birth. From the book of Isaiah, we read the words of our Lord. O be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. Isaiah 65:18. From the New Testament, the words of Paul to the people of the Church of Galatia. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Galatians 5, 25. Let us pray. We joyfully praise you, O Lord, for the fulfillment of your promise of your Savior and what that means in our lives. Thank you for the gift of salvation through the birth of your Son, Jesus. Create us anew as we wait, and help us to see your glory as you fill our lives with your loving spirit. Amen. When you came through um, the, the back doors or through the side, if you don't have one, our um, gentlemen at the back have one for you, or there's one here at the front. But if you um, grab one, there's a great um, place to communicate with us. You just tear this off, and if you'll just write down your name, if you're a first-time uh, visitor with us, give us your name and the information. We won't knock on your door or anything like that. Just let you know when things are going on here at the church. Just say hello. We're glad that you're here. It's a wonderful Christmas spirit. How, are you guys getting in the spirit? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Everybody's really quiet this morning. Everybody good? Lots of smiles. Welcome on Facebook, YouTube. Uh, we're just glad that you're here. Welcome to this morning's worship. Well, the, uh, during this holiday season, as you know, we were trying to get through all your favorite Christmas carols. So we're going to do that again this morning with, uh, in a moment with the praise team. I want to let you know that if you've been wondering about this empty choir loft up here, in January we're going to try to fix that. And we're going to try to start choir back uh, in January. And we, uh, we, if you are one of our choir singers, or maybe you're somebody new and we didn't know that you could do that kind of thing, uh, we, we make it easy, we make it very convenient for people. So uh, first uh, week in January, the first Wednesday that's available, we'll tell you about that and you'll get plenty of information. So prepare yourself for that. All right, the best known Christmas carol of all, Joy to the World, stand together for the sing. Thank you. 
that will be faced not only for days, months, and years to come in these communities. Lord, we pray for your presence to be made known. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we enter into our time of celebration, we want to celebrate what God did over the weekend. We had a lot of people that helped produce our live nativity as we ministered to our community. So if you were an actor, if you helped build a set, if you served hot chocolate and popcorn, if you helped with parking, if you built a set, uh, if you helped with costumes, if you did anything helping with the live nativity, we stand and let's uh, give thanks to these people who gave the time and effort. We had 140 cars come through the live nativity. And uh, we presented the gospel to them, not only through the story, the Christmas story, but we handed out a presentation of the gospel as they received popcorn, and we made connections. Uh, my next door neighbors, who I've been praying that would come to church at one time or another, I've been praying for a long time, were in the church. So give praise for that, and pray that God will continue to use that in a great way. We have an opportunity to continue to be givers through our tithes and offerings this morning. This day, for this time we have, to now give back to you just a portion of all we have blessed this year. And dear Lord, we just thank you for your presence, not only in the good times, but in the bad times also. And help us to always put our faith and our trust in you, rather than the things of this world. Now, as we give of these tithes and offerings, we pray that both the gift and the giver will be used to advance your kingdom. In our precious name we pray.
Thank you, Barbara. Passage this morning is 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 9. We focus on joy this morning. Have you ever met somebody who's a giver? I met a young lady when I was in college, and she was a giver. There was just something different about her. She had a magnetic personality. She was kind of short. She wasn't the most attractive person, um, a girl on the campus by any means, but there was something about her that attracted people to her. So much so that I dated her for a little bit. She was in, there was just something about her. And the reason was that she was a giver. She, as you interacted with her at our Baptist Student Union events or uh, just around campus, she was always on the lookout for people that might have a need. And if she heard of it, she'd be like, I got one of those. I'll get it for you. And she'd make it happen. If somebody had, uh, even if it was monetary, she didn't mind. She would just whip out her purse and she'd give somebody some money. Or it didn't always have to be a material thing. If somebody had a need that somebody else could meet or a, 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 a person that could meet a certain need, she would connect them. And people could tell. People liked hanging around her. I liked hanging around her. It was cool. She radiated joy because she met people's needs. And she was a giver. And it was kind of opposite of me, I hate to say. My parents divorced and we struggled financially. My mom worked two jobs and she literally struggled to put food on the table for us to have clothes to wear, to pay for all those endless fees at school for us three kids, pay for the house and the mortgage and the bills. So I, I don't know if that's what it is or if it's something else, but I tend to be a little cheap. <laughs> Ask Stephanie. I have a hard time releasing things. I have a hard time being a giver, and that's really not a good combination for Stephanie. I, God had to have a reason for putting us together. Because guess what her love language is? Gifts. And I'm not really a good gift giver. I'm not, I'm not a good giver. So actually, it's probably a good thing. God knew what he was doing. He knew I needed to work on that. But there's something about being a giver. There is a connection between giving and joy. Now certainly as we are kids, there is no greater joy than waking up on, on Christmas morning, is there not? Coming down the stairs as fast as you can, finding what has been left for you at the base of the tree. You dream about it. You anticipate it. It is one of the greatest moments of the year. It produces great, great joy. There's nothing quite like it. But something changes as you get older. Something is different as you mature as a person, as a human being. It shifts. Suddenly, or maybe not suddenly, but over time, you receive more joy from the act of giving than even of receiving. There is a connection between giving and joy. Now, you might think that my sermon is all about giving, and you might think that I'm harping or wanting you to give more. I don't preach a lot of sermons on giving, financial giving, but one thing I do want to communicate to Flint Hill Baptist Church and you all is you all are already awesome givers. Whenever there's a need, this church steps up. Even our budget now, we have exceeded our need, our budget need, because of your faithful giving. And that's been the case most of the way, even through the pandemic. 
God has used you all as great givers the entire time that I have been here. And you have a great legacy of that. By, so I'm not preaching this to tell you that I want you to give more. I'm telling you, we're talking about financial giving and giving of ourselves. Because I want you to understand there is a strong and fundamental connection between giving and joy. We're going to see the early church is dealing with harsh circumstances. A famine has hit Palestine, Jerusalem, and Judea. All the Christians in these places are suffering along with everybody else. Now this would be especially hard for early believers because early believers were people without a people group. By confessing Christ as their Lord, they would be shunned by their Jewish community. They would be ignored and harassed by the Roman government. So the early Christians had no government to help them, no social help to help them. Their people group in the midst of a natural disaster probably would not help them as well. And so Paul, as he writes to the Corinthian church, he's asking for help for the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem who are especially hard hit. And he tells them by about one special group of people, a church in Macedonia. And what they did when they heard about the need of their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. So let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to start with verses 1 through 4. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given amongst the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty has overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. First thing we need to see is that giving produces joy. Giving produces joy. The Macedonian church in the New Testament was described this way. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. <clears throat> I have a question for you that is this. How in the world does trials and poverty sit and live in the same verse as joy and generosity. <clears throat> My friends, when we don't give, we're robbing ourselves of the opportunity to experience joy. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each of you should give what you've decided in your own heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You see, giving is not a luxury of the rich. It is the privilege of the poor. Giving is not a luxury of the rich. It is the privilege of the poor. The Macedonian churches plead. They beg for an opportunity to give. Evidently, others have told them, you all don't need to give. You all don't need to spend a, send a special love offering to their church because you're dealing with harsh circumstances. You're dealing with poverty. They're dealing with harsh circumstances and poverty. And what do they do? They beg and plead for the opportunity to give. What a contrast to us sometimes. We come up with endless justifications not to be givers. See, the Macedonian church had a handle on four important truths. And they're truths that I want us to hold on to as well. The first is this. Joy comes from knowing the owner. Joy comes from knowing the owner. Deuteronomy 8, 18 says, All blessings come from the Father. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he that gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirms his covenant, which he swore 
to our forefathers as it is today. Job 41.11 Everything under heaven belongs to me. That's God speaking. Psalm 24.1 The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. Haggai 2.8 The silver is mine. The gold is mine. Declares the Lord Almighty. 1 Corinthians 6. 19-20 You were not your own. You were bought at a price. You see, all our money, all our possessions, our home, your car, your clothes, it all belongs to God. And when we realize that fact, it frees us up to be givers. It frees us up to use those material things as he sees fit. <coughs> when we understand that truth, that he's the owner, we're able to be obedient. To what he calls us to do with it. The second thing the Macedonian church knew is that joy comes from knowing who's the manager. Who's the manager? I am God's money manager. I am his steward. I am his steward. You know what a steward is? Somebody who manages the money of the owner of that money. It is his job to figure out what the owner wants done with that money, with those assets, and then carry out the will of the owner. Once a distraught man rode his horse up to John Wesley, shouting, Mr. Wesley, something terrible has happened. Your house burned to the ground. Wesley weighed the news, and then he calmly replied, No, the Lord's house burned to the ground. That means less responsibility for me. John Wesley knew that he was a steward, not an owner. Whenever we think that we are the owner, red flags should go up. We had a donkey out here this weekend. His name was Buttercup. Tim... <clears throat> Graciously found and had a friend who had that donkey. And he kept telling his friend, thank you for letting us use Buttercup. And he kept saying, no, 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 no. Don't thank me for letting you all use Buttercup. It ain't my donkey. It's God's donkey. Why shouldn't God be able to use his donkey for your live nativity? He had it. He understood. It's not his. It's God's. He is just a steward. I've told you before. My father, if he owned anything of value, it had a gold sticker on the back of it. It said, owner, God, steward, Steve Deffinger, his address and phone number. All over his house, anything of value, that sticker was on there. A constant reminder of who owned things that he had and who was the steward. Now, how do we as a steward Navigate what we're supposed to do with the things that God gives us. <clears throat> the one thing I want you to understand is that a steward has legitimate needs. And God wants us to meet those needs. God is generous. He doesn't demand that we as his stewards go without a roof over our head, food to eat, clothes to wear, the ability to get to and from a job. But the question is, when do we start abusing our role as steward? Does he see us eating out extravagantly, often? Does he see us spending the money that he's given us on ho a home or houses that are bigger than we need? Tying up resources that he's given us to steward? Does he see us extravagantly spending money on ourselves, clothes, shoes, cars, vacation homes, whatever it might be? At what point are we abusing our role as steward? Let's keep reading verses 5 through 7. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, 
We urge Titus that as he has started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Here we see the joy comes from participating in God's grace. It comes from participating in God's grace. In these three verses, in the original language, Paul uses the word grace three times to describe the Macedonian act of giving. In verse 6, Paul calls the Macedonians giving to help the hungry in Jerusalem an act of grace. The same Greek word is used for Christian giving as is used for God's grace that he extends to us. Christ's grace defines, motivates, and puts in perspective our giving. Our giving is a reflexive response to the grace of God in our lives. It is a working out of the grace that God gives us. We extend that grace, and it comes to fruition when we give to others, like thunder that follow, like thunder that follows lightning. They're really the same thing. They can't be separated. Giving is grace, and Jesus began the giving, and it causes the giving, the grace of giving in us. Verses eight and nine. I say this is not a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Joy comes from being like Christ. Joy comes from being like Christ. What a powerful verse 9 is. It's a wonderful exchange of what we value and what we expect. So we can know God's grace. Jesus, who was rich, became poor. So we who are poor could become rich. This flips everything on its head. When we think that we're rich, We're hoarding things and money. We're actually poor. It is only through giving, like Jesus did, that we become rich. We are most like Christ when we're giving. Gaze upon Christ long enough and you will become a giver. Give long enough and you will become more like Christ. Jesus spent his whole life giving to others. He gave to the sick, to the hungry, to the thirsty, to the morally corrupt, to the sinner. He gave to the outcast, to those who were hated, to the diseased, to the criminal, to the blind, to the barren, to the lame. Jesus spent his whole life giving. He was a gift from his father. He started the whole gift giving thing that we call Christmas. Do you know why we give gifts at Christmas to each other? Because we are reflecting the character and nature of God himself, who was the ultimate gift giver as he gave his son, who was the gift to us, who spent his whole life giving, and it culminated on his gift to us, of the forgiveness of our sins as he gave his life on the cross for us. The scriptures say in no uncertain terms, you should be like Christ. To be a Christian is to be Christ-like. So we should be givers. Jesus became poor so we might be rich. He is the ultimate giver. Our giving is a response to him as a gift and to him giving. Giving jumpstarts our relationship with God. When when I open up my hands to give, we can then 
take what God has given us. People who understand this concept are givers, and they're people filled with joy. The more we give, the more we delight in our giving, the more God delights in us. Our giving pleases us, but more importantly, it pleases God. Giving infuses life with joy. It integrates the eternal dimension and supernatural qualities of our faith into our everyday life. To give is to be like Christ. To give is to be Christ to others. And to give is to experience joy. Jesus says in John 15, he says, I tell you, you want to experience joy? You want complete joy? Be like me. Love on others. Give as I give. When I was in seminary, I met another young lady. She was also a giver. And this time, she was the best looking girl on campus. Her name was Steph. <laughs> she was a giver. She loves meeting people's needs. She's good for me. And together, because of her, there's nothing in our house that is our own. There's nothing that can't be a blessing to somebody else. There's no room, there's no vehicle, there's no money that can't be used help me somebody's name. God knew what he was doing when he put us together. Giving brings us joy. I hate it. I love you, Kyle, but I can't stand it when it comes out. I can't stand it when I have to write that check to the gas company. A cable company. Really? But there are a few checks that I love to write. I love to write the check that we write to tell them a seal. A young lady we've been sponsoring for about 10 years now, providing clean drinking water for her, meals for her and her family, the gospel, and an education to her. I love it when that comes out of my check. Yeah, I'm making a difference across the globe. Every month, we write a check. It's the first check that is written at Flint Hill Baptist Church. And I love writing that check. Because when I write that check, I know that we're doing things like we did on Friday night. I know I'm helping support that. I know that we're making that money is going to make a difference here in Fort Mill, in York County, across our state. I know a portion of that goes to the, our cooperative program to support missionaries across North America. I know that part of that money that I'm writing, when I write that check, goes across to our Southern Baptist missionaries across the globe, and they are changing the world. And my check, my giving, is making an eternal difference, and I love it. It brings me joy. Being a giver in God's kingdom brings me great joy. And it is a great joy that is available to you. You've got a treasure chest in your midst. The grace of giving. The treasure chest of joy. And the key is being a giver. Don't miss out on the joy that you receive when you're a giver in the kingdom of God. Joy is a treasure chest. And the key is our giving. We pray with me. The gift of the Messiah that came at Christmas time. Your son. I thank you for the example that he's given each and every one of us. Every day of his life, he gave. <coughs> so he ultimately gave everything that he was on the cross for me and every person sitting in this room. It is because of that gift that we're able to sing joy to the world. It's why we're able to experience joy not just at Christmas time, but every day of the year. It's 
why our joy is not tied to our finances. It's why our joy is not tied to the season, whether we're with family or without family, whether our job situation is good or bad, whether we're in good health or bad health, we always have access to joy because of the great gift that you gave at Christmas time. May we reflect your character and nature of how we live out our lives through our checkbooks and how we interact with others on a daily basis. May we be givers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have a song of invitation. Come, all you faithful opportunity for you to respond. If you're not a Christian, you don't know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about that great gift, the gift of joy that God has given us. You can enter into a love relationship with Jesus this morning. I'd love to pray with you make that happen. Even while we sing, I invite you to come forward. I'd love to pray with you. And Christian, is your life Exemplified through giving. What can you do, even today, to be a giver? Not just financially, but as you interact with those around you. Your spouse, your children, your grandchildren. How can you be a giver towards your neighbors, towards your co-workers? How can you be an example of what Christ was to us? How can you live out the manger scene tomorrow morning? Be the gift. Christ was to us. Let's stand, let's sing this great. <laughs>
We have a video here explaining the heart of Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Mm -hmm. We all lead busy lives, but if we could just stop everything and take a bird's eye view, a little higher, there, now we can see the multitudes. We are fueled by a shared vision to bring the name of Christ to those who have yet to hear. So we move forward to extreme places, corners of the world that have no access to the gospel, and train missionaries, send them out together, and pray that God's grace be known. We help the hurting, comfort the dying, give hope to the displaced, and have seen thousands come to faith in Christ. We are able to do so much more together than if we were chasing this vision alone. This is our common effort. Together. There are three ways you can respond to this emphasis. The first is to pray. Pray for our international missionaries who have gone on our behalf. The next is to give. Next week we will take up our Lottie Moon offering. We will have a special in gathering time in our worship service. Pray about what you can give next week. And next is to go. Today is the deadline to sign up for the Puerto Rico mission trip. Forms can be found in the church bulletin board. We are called to go. How about you? Today is the deadline to sign up for our annual Christmas luncheon next Sunday. The cost is only $5 per person. Um, the meal will be catered, and we will give away door prizes after the meal. Shirley Davis will be over here in the foyer if you would like a ticket. Uh, after service, after the business meeting. <coughs> Today, after the service, we will have our family business meeting. After we pray, we will allow for any guests we have. Um, we will pray. We will ask any guests we have to uh, take this opportunity to slip out. We ask all church members to stay to be part of this important part of church life. And, oh, and one more thing. Uh, today is also the deadline to sign up for the senior adult Christmas luncheon. That will be Tuesday at 11, uh, featuring Carrie and Ellen Twitty. If you have not gotten your tickets and would like to attend, uh, Johnny Dagenhart will be in the foyer after service and after the <coughs> business meeting, um, to, so you can buy those tickets. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for allowing us to come together today. Father, we ask you to, to be with us this time this year. Allow us to feel this joy that you have for us, this joy that we have by giving for you. Lord, we ask you to be with us this week. We thank you for an amazing weekend here. We ask you to be with those that were affected by the storm so heavily over this past weekend as well. We ask you to be with us as we prepare for this business meeting and now allow your will to be done. Amen. Amen.